Let's take a few moments now to be still. We'd like to continue to remember the first commandment, to return to the one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. One presence, one power, one life, one mind. On all-encompassing divine activity in which we live and move and have our being. And we want to remember that each of us is one with the one and one in the one. And we remember tonight that as we consider another of these great laws of living, that we're dealing with a part of ourselves which transcends all human experience and our goal is as always to release our imprisoned splendor to enable us to deal with life and all of its changing challenging experiences in a higher state of consciousness and thus in so dealing with life find the kind of harmony and happiness and peace and success that we all innately desire. We're grateful for this time together, grateful for the ability that is ours to, as the scriptures put it, to lift up our eyes to the hills, to look away from the confusion of the day and to center our attention upon the one. And so be it. All right, let's uh, continue in our consideration of the Ten Commandments. Someone shared with me a cartoon. <clears throat> I wish we had a means of blowing it up and showing it to you. It'd be much better visually than my trying to tell about it, but I thought it was kind of cute and ap appropriate. It shows a picture of uh, uh, some nomadic people, obviously the Israelites, uh, all excitedly pouring out of their tents, and uh, someone is pointing off in the hills and down from the hills is, is coming a man with a long white beard, obviously Moses, and he's carrying in his left hand, holding high as if to show everybody that he's found it, a little bottle. And uh, the caption is, uh, our headaches are over. Here comes Moses with the tablets. So much for the humor for tonight. <laughs> but in a sense, uh, it's kind of interesting because there are many who think of the Ten Commandments as, um, as the panacea for all the problems of the world. And many say, you know, if we could just get people to live by the Ten Commandments, we'd have no more problems. Strangely enough, as I've pointed out time and time again, many of those folks who take that simplistic, moralistic view that if people would live by the Ten Commandments, we'd have a good society, many of them don't even know what they are, couldn't repeat them, wouldn't know where to find them in the Bible, and don't understand them if they can repeat them. So it's a big cliche. It's one of the greatest cliches that have been foisted upon society. The Ten Commandments. People say, I live by the Golden Rule and the Ten Commandments. That's all I need. They live by them, all right, right next door. And they're buried down in the vault somewhere. So we've been taught uh, to, to keep the commandments. And it's my contention that we've kept them all too well. We've kept them all bottled up. And so rather than stressing the need to keep the commandments, it seems to me we need to stress the importance of breaking the commandments and learn how to break them, to break them down, break them down into their, their fundamental components and come to understand the principles that underlie them. If they are principles, then they should be workable constantly. And if they're not principles, then we should safely put them to rest and forget about them. So we're suggesting that in the higher insight into the commandments, we're dealing not just with, with ways of improving conduct or, or changing character, but rather in modifying consciousness. And uh, I've suggested time and time again that morals and ethics are fine and can be very helpful to us or to society as a whole, but one can be very morally correct and ethically true and uh, 
Still, if his consciousness is a killer, his life is going to be in shambles. In other words, the great need is to find an integration of the self. Um, at their root, the commandments uh, are not essentially coercive, but supportive. They are put in terms of thou shalt not, much in the same way as we erect fences to keep children in the yard. But there comes a time when the child must develop a self-reliance and must be able to deal with the world, and then the fences are no longer adequate. And as a matter of fact, they become restrictive to his growth. So that the commandments in their <clears throat> superficial form are thou shalt nots, but we must break them down beyond that and understand the fundamental law, and law itself is supportive, not coercive. And when we understand the law, then the need is to make a commitment to it. Now the seventh commandment, which I facetiously said was our X-rated commandment, is uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now this is, this is kind of strange, and there's a great paradox that, uh, that uh, we see in relationship to this commandment. Because moralistic religion uh, gave rise to Puritanism and uh, to Victorianism, and out of that came the emphasis on prudery, and a prudery so severe that the word adultery was not a fit word to use in good society. So that the commandment itself could never be discussed because it was naughty. You know, it's like the word uh, sex. It's a dirty word, so you can't discuss it. So that the paradox has been that this commandment, which has great significance and great meaning, has been rarely heard of. Today there is, there's more of a uh, tendency to, as we say, tell it like it is, even if what is is not particularly uplifting. And many think that uh, this evidences that there's a great increase of uh, immorality in our society. I don't think so at all, though this is debatable. I think basically there is a decrease in hypocrisy. I think that people are not really less moral today, they're more honest, and uh, there are some of us that perhaps cringe a little bit at honesty. But the word uh, adultery is an interesting word. As a matter of fact, I find that one of the most fascinating studies is the study of words and how, how confused we are about words. Someone once said, oh, I know what adultery is. This was, this was not a person making a funny, but he really said this, even though it came out kind of funny. He said, I don't know what adultery is. He said, it's, uh, it's an adult playing around. <laughs> and uh, so I said, um, well, now, are you sure that, uh, that there is a relationship between the word adult and the word adultery? Well, obviously. And so the first thing, you know, we found that the complication was that... Uh, that if it's the natural uh, state of an infant to, to live in infancy, then it should be the natural state of an adult to commit adultery. <laughs> and so that led us up a blind alley. So the interesting thing we discovered was that, uh, that there's no relationship whatever between adult and adultery. They come from entirely different words. That's one of the confusions of the English language. The word adult is from the Latin past participle of um, adolescere, which means to grow up. It's related to adolescent. And the word adulterate means to pollute or to add something other. The ad and alter are the two basic words, and the alter meaning other. To add something other, something foreign, as it were. And adultery comes from the second word, not the first. So there's no relationship between adultery and adult. Here ends the English lesson. So anyway, uh, it, it's rather interesting that, uh, that sociologically uh, the effect of adultery is, uh, is self-evident. Um, and there's probably never been a society in, in all of the rise and fall of the world's civilizations that was so degraded as to completely ignore this, this law, this, this need to have some kind of control over the breakdown of, uh, of family integrity. And it may well be that the Israelites were made great because of their adherence to this and to other high moral principles. And certainly, whatever we say tonight, we have no intent to, uh, to in any way break down the emphasis upon the idea of thou shalt not commit adultery. 
The thing that we want to stress, however, is that oftentimes societies and religions and philosophies have placed tremendous emphasis upon the integrity of the society as a whole, on the integrity of a nation, on the integrity of a religion, the integrity of a church, the integrity of a family unit, at the expense of the integrity of the person. So that one of the things that, that comes out of a, of a deep study of this idea of, uh, of the ban on committing adultery is that oftentimes a person is forced into a situation where he has to fulfill the requirement to keep the integrity of a family unit at the expense of the breakdown of his own integrity and of his own personhood. But let's think about that. What is adultery? A question we might ask, and again, uh, I suppose 50 years ago we wouldn't be able to ask such a question in polite society. Uh, it's rather interesting that uh, I've discovered that some recent findings in Aramaic studies have revealed that the word adultery in the scriptures originally had reference to problems of pregnancy and that adultery was, was essentially an act of copulation after conception. Now again, this is conjectural, but this is, this is what uh, some researchers have uh, seemed to set forth. There is a current book on the subject sex and the unborn child in which uh, a case is made medically, psychologically, and theologically for the need to discourage physical relations during pregnancy and suggesting that this is one of the important causes of brain-damaged children. Now, again, I don't know any, whether this is valid or not, but uh, it does have some relationship to, to that uh, study of, uh, of the Aramaic in indicating that, uh, that adultery did not essentially refer to relations out of wedlock, but, uh, but basically a relation with a pregnant woman. However... Consider again the, the emphasis of the meaning of the word. Um, because from the Hebrew root, the word adultery seems to imply a total or complete abandoning of, uh, of one's principles. Uh, we have a word, uh, apostasy, which seems to uh, relate to that. And the word again is made up of the word uh, uh, to add and alter, meaning other. Meanings to add other or to to add something foreign to a situation, a body, a relationship, or whatever, and thus to break down its, its purity. In other words, it, it indicates a kind of pollution. Now, in the old days, um, I'm sure most of us can look back to that. The old days sounds like a gray beard talking. But uh, in, in our modern um, business ethical thing which which is not uh, perhaps as much a matter of the growth of ethics as it is a matter of public relations and the emphasis upon uh, upon at least appearing to have some sort of guidelines also a result of certain government controls uh, the situation has changed some but it hasn't been too long ago since for instance dairies would uh, occasionally if not often and maybe always unscrupulously add water to milk to make it go farther and grocers were not above putting sand in sugar and uh, rocks in beans and water in vinegar. And um, if you've ever found uh, uh, rocks in dried beans, you may have thought that that got there inadvertently or maybe that was the way they were developed or something, but uh, by and large they were put there because they weigh more. And, uh, and this is adultery, you see. This essentially is what the word adultery or adulterate means. It means to add something other which uh, breaks down the quality. Uh, so to adulterate uh, means to add something that cheapens a situation or upsets the completeness of the whole. So in a literal sense, uh, adultery in terms of relationships usually refers to sex relations outside of marriage, or oftentimes the word is used generally to, to relate to people who are living together out of wedlock and just the fact that two people are living together, that they're committing adultery, according to some religious people and theologians and uh, some people who are just plain prudes. But uh, the, the important thing, I think, is, is that 
we want to, to try to rise above judgments and to understand something basic that is involved, first of all relating to relationships and then relating to the widespread application of this word adultery. A young girl once said to me, and her, re, her, her thoughts were reacting to, to a lot of the, the criticism about, uh, about the free life of young people and so forth. She was saying, I don't see why we make such a big thing about sex. She says it's, it's perfectly normal activity like eating or sleeping, sleeping. Why should we treat it in any other way? Why all the taboos and why all the restrictions and the uh, pr uh, uh, prudery and so forth? Well, obviously, the girl is reacting to the, the very Victorian morals of her grandmother, who was probably wrong, because purity is not the same thing as prudery. Uh, purity is a matter of consciousness. Prudery simply uh, indicates a moralistic hang-up. And as a matter of fact, it could well be said from a Freudian point of view that the person who is an excessive prude may well have strong sexual desires that are being frustrated, though I'm not a psychiatrist, not willing to, to make a judgment in that half. But the young girl is also wrong in saying that, uh, that sex is just as normal as eating because the emphasis here is on sex as a thing. But actually, sex is not a thing, but purely a way in which a person expresses himself. If we deal with sex purely as a thing, then we reduce ourselves to the level of animals, and this is the adultery. In other words, it's, it's the motivation within us, and it's what happens in our consciousness and not what we do with or between people. You see, now this is the important thing to keep in mind because it leads right back to the awareness of our attitudes and, and to the level of consciousness. Um, persons in or out of marriage who engage in a term that's often used, sex without love, to a large extent, and I believe this, are prostituting themselves because there is, a, there is an adulteration of one's whole nature in terms of, of using the sex expression for a certain amount of gratification without any true communion in love, you see. And I think this is, this is a very vital thing. It's a subject that I've covered in my book, Life is for Loving. Uh, in other words, there is a tendency to, to sell ourselves short on the idea of the real meaning of life, which I really believe can only be found in the, in the total communion of persons in the fullness of inner-centered love. Now, we may insist that it is immoral for two people to have sex relations outside of marriage or or for people to, to live together unmarried, and there's an awful lot of judgments made in this behalf. And I'm not about to, to take any stand as to what's moral or what's immoral, because morality is, uh, is basically judgmental and has a great deal to do with the mores of a society which change. But what I do uh, insist on is asking some questions. Could it not be that it is less moral uh, for married persons to live together, even though they have a legal license, to live together beyond the time when there is a total breakdown of any true love or spiritual relationship, to live together out of obligation to the children or by reason of society's taboo and upon divorce. How can we say that one is less moral or more moral than the other? In whatever way we view morality, is it not moral to be honest and immoral to lie? I think that fills pretty much the, the definition of what morality is, at least in part. If two people are honest with themselves, really honest with themselves and with each other, and come to the conclusion that they do not want the legal responsibilities of marriage, should they be considered less moral than two people who are living a lie in a marital facade behind which there is a complete and total psychological and spiritual separation? I only ask the questions, but uh, I, think, I think that this is, 
an area that needs to be carefully considered before we so loosely say this is committing adultery. Uh, obviously, there's a great need to revise a lot of old beliefs. This was Paul's thought, metanoia, the transformation of the mind. To change the consciousness, be ye renewed by the renewing of your mind, be transformed to unlearn our errors, to let go of a lot of limited views that we have about life. We so easily add on or add alter, which is adulterate. This is what the word adultery comes from, to add on, to add something. And thus we actually weaken the truth to the point where eventually we are simply expressing moral views and judgments and criticisms and we've totally turned away from our own roots and from our own, own basic beliefs. So that while we may be accusing someone of adultery, we're committing adultery ourselves, because we're adulterating what we are. We're adulterating our own inner values and standards. Now, obviously, there's, there's a much deeper meaning to this commandment, as we've discovered in all of them. A spiritual law that, to me, is so beautiful and so wonderful that it is tragic that it has been so rarely expressed and so rarely understood. The emphasis, as we've said, has almost always been on the so-called sin or physical acts and personal relationships. But the sin is not in the act. The sin is in the thought or the state of consciousness that may ultimately lead to an act. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it will. But the sin and the true adulteration in consciousness is in our own mentality. Now, you recall Jesus tried to lift the commandments out of uh, the purely prudish and moralistic frame in which uh, uh, they, by and large, have been accepted, in which in his, his day the pious Pharisees accepted them, where they could keep the letter of the law and condemn and criticize and even stone to death any person caught up in a web of human emotions and thus uh, otherwise outwardly breaking the commandments. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. In other words, this lifts the commandment into a very much higher frame of reference and begins to imply the fundamental of divine law the law of right thinking, the law of consciousness, takes it out of just the element of pure morals and conduct or character. Now, we miss the underlying principle if we simply deal with relationships which we call immoral and uh, refer to some things as adultery and some things as perfectly logically right and so forth. There is an application, certainly in the area of relationships, but, as we say, the emphasis must be on the attitude, on the thought, on the state of mind, which may or may not lead to an, a, an outward act. The broader implication, you see, leads, deals with consciousness in all of its applications in life. It could be said that Judas was an adulterer. Now, you may recall that Jesus often referred to the Pharisees as adulterers, and he referred to this adulterous generation. Now, one may assume from the purely religious or moralistic point of view that he was saying that all these people are out committing adultery. This is not likely, because, mind you, in Jesus' day, the sin of committing adultery was punishable by being stoned to death. And uh, it is probably true that, that there would be less adultery committed, and they were very literal about it, in that kind of a climate than there would in others. So therefore, it is not likely that when he talks about the adulterous generation that he's talking about immoral acts. So that the chances are very likely that he's talking about adultery in terms of the adulteration or the pollution of consciousness. In other words, you can say that certain times an office gets involved in, in a very, very negative 
uh, situation where people are bickering and the vibrations are terribly bad, you can say this office has been polluted mentally and therefore it is an adulterous office. This is the thing that he's talking about, you see. And, uh, and I think that if we understand this, then we begin to deal with this broader implication of, of the law. So as I say, Judas was probably an adulterer simply because he didn't see the spiritual depth in Jesus. He uh, confused the Christ idea with, uh, with temporal authority and material rewards, and he missed the whole idea. So, and this is where it begins to pinch, whenever we see less than the good or the divine or the Christ in any person or in ourselves, we commit adultery. Because in our view, in our image, in our attitude, we adulterate or add something other than the pure and break down the whole. When was the last time you committed adultery? In this sense, you see. It becomes very shocking. Um, no wonder Jesus said to those who were about to stone the woman who had been taken in adultery, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, quite often it has, it has been suggested that probably Jesus had some ESP and he was able to know that these men were philanderers and they would all were having little affairs on the side and so forth. Well, that could be. I wasn't there. I don't know. It is doubtful that this is what he meant. It seems more likely that he had in mind the sin of the mind, because this is where the emphasis was normally placed in his teaching. In other words, he was saying, if any one of you is free from the sin of the adulteration of truth, of not seeing the best in people, of not seeing the divinity within them, let him stand up and administer the punishment to this unfortunate woman. Now, there's another interesting thing. He then says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more, because all the men turned and walked away. And he said, uh, I can't condemn you either. Now, some would be shocked at this, because I insist that, um, that Jesus was a man on the quest for perfection. He was far along the path. But his great contribution to religion was not that he came revealing himself as divine, but that he came revealing the potential of man as divine and proved it in his own life. And I think there are evidences along the way, and I certainly find them very understandable and uh, very satisfying, actually, evidences of times when he was something less than totally perfect in his outward expression. For instance, the time when he whipped the money changers out of the temple, he blew his top and got angry. Now we say, but that was righteous indignation. He had a right to do this. Did he? Look at his teaching very carefully. He leaves no room for equivocation. Resist not him that is evil. Turn the other cheek. Go the uh, second mile, you see. He didn't turn the other cheek on this occasion. He blew his top and pushed them all, pushed their tables over and kicked them out. Well, obviously he had a good reason. But it also reveals that there were times, perhaps all too brief, and certainly very brief, when he had the same kind of pressures upon him and at first began to experience the same kind of pollution of attitude that we experience from time to time. Paul says that he... Uh, had sins such as we, but, uh, but uh, didn't give in to them. You see, tested in all points of we, he said, but, uh, but without sin, as he puts it. In other words, he had the same kind of pressures. So that I believe that when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, he's talking about mind pollution. He's talking about adulteration of thought on the matter that, uh, that uh, if one is truly pure of mind, he will never see another person as anything less then from the level of the Christ in him, he was saying, even I can't condemn you in this situation, so go and sin no more, you see. 
Now, I believe that, that this brings it into an area, first of all, that it makes us all, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, fair game for this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But it also should help us to be very understanding with ourselves. Because it deals with you and with me all the time. That's why I say, when was the last time you committed adultery? When was the last time you allowed yourself to proliferate mind pollution to pass along any kind of negativity or to dwell in it yourself? Um, the interesting thing is that if, if one of the accusers under this standard, if one of the accusers was actually free of, of mental uh, sin up to that moment, by his act of standing up and accusing and thereby throwing the stone at the woman, he would then be committing adultery. So it's a pretty exact standard, you see. But that's the way the commandments work. They're not just arbitrary laws set down to punish people. They're dealing with fundamental spiritual laws. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not adulterate or add alter or add something foreign unto that which is pure. You shall not adulterate the truth. You shall not pollute that which is pure and holy by, as Paul says, seeing in a mirror darkly, failing to see the truth and see rightly. The teacher or the preacher who agonizes over the decadence of modern society talks about the sins of man and how we're all going to hell and so forth is breaking this commandment by his resistant thoughts. I've always... Uh, enjoyed flipping the dials on, on a radio, especially if I'm out of town. And if I find myself alone in a hotel room somewhere, if they have a radio, I like to lift up the dials and see who's on. And, and one of the most entertaining things that I find is to, to listen to the radio preachers. I mean, who am I to talk? Because I'm one. But uh, <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's seeing what the rest of the world is doing. But I find that I have some very entertaining moments uh, hearing a good old fiery sermon by a fundamentalist preacher just pulling out all the stops and telling us all the horrible things about society. And I can remember once many years ago, I was totally entertained for a full half hour while a radio preacher preached a sermon on the sin of dancing. And I was going to say you wouldn't believe, but maybe you would because I'm sure you've heard this sort of thing, but uh, this, this man really did it up. Uh, he left nothing to the imagination. He told you how these two young people come together and how they're filled with passion and emotion, how while they're dancing they rub their bodies up against one another, and he told of all the lurid thoughts that were going on in their minds and so forth, and this went on and on and on and on. And you know... I couldn't help but come to the conclusion, and I wonder how anybody else could draw any other conclusion, that the man was exposing himself before all society, <laughs> showing what a totally filthy mind he had. <laughs> now, it could well be that, that, that dancing is, a, is a, an evolved rhythmic uh, experience that comes from certain tribal tribal rites that maybe at one time were very sensual and so forth. But I can tell you that in modern times it's gone so far away from that that quite often the young people don't even touch together. They're off doing their own thing on the floor, you know. So maybe the man hadn't caught up with the times yet. But uh, the, the the important thing is, I think that that. Anyone who, who becomes terribly upset or disturbed about the depravity of society, and uh, let's face it, we all do from time to time, don't we? We would do well to take a look at ourselves and ask ourselves honestly, if the atmosphere around us is polluted, are we going to help in any way to resolve this pollution by adding more pollution? And this is exactly what we do when we adulterate ourself and our consciousness and our inner self-image and awareness by emphasizing the depravity, the limitation, the sin, the shoddy ways that people act and so forth and project this kind 
of, of energy and force from our consciousness. Pollution is something people are very much concerned about in our society, and rightly so. But I suspect the time will come when we'll realize that mind pollution is probably the, the great problem. And that until we begin to clean up the mind pollution, maybe the other will never really get off the ground. As I've said so often, you might try to, if you have a garden, you might try to keep the children off the grass. And you might put a, have a little education program, put a sign up, keep off the grass, don't walk here. Then you'll put a fence, and then pretty soon a higher fence and a higher fence, and pretty soon you've got barbed wire over the top of it. And now your, your garden, to all intent and purposes, is destroyed by the sheer need to keep people off it. But actually, you can't keep people off the grass until attitudes are changed. And the only way is to help children and adults to become grass conscious. You can't keep people from throwing their cigarette wrappers on the street until they become conscious, first of all, of what a beautiful city is and what it does for everybody. Until they're conscious of this and participate in it, no signs or even fines are going to keep them from it, you see. That's the problem of commandments. So that before we can overcome any kind of, of ecological problems in the world, we're going to have to, first of all, change, revise some attitudes and ideas and become more conscious of the need for a wiser and, and more discriminating way in which we get rid of our garbage and our, and our uh, smoke and so forth. So actually, mental pollution is the real problem. And I believe that this is the overriding meaning of this, uh, this commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's not that we're saying that, that uh, the, the literal use of the word commit adultery no longer has validity, because it does. It's a very important. It's important for young people. It's important for adults. But it's important basically not in the sense that you cannot do this because society says you cannot, but it's important that the person knows that in any way giving in to certain basic passions without any kind of, of uh, redeeming grace of, of a feeling of affection or love for, for one another that he's actually uh, polluting his own consciousness, destroying his own self-image, and thereby adulterating the tremendous spiritual being that he potentially is. And I think that's the important area to see it. Uh, the word commit, I think, brings the matter of adultery back to the person because it literally means to send forth, you see. And uh, so the, the idea, the perversion, whatever it may be, begins in consciousness and we send it forth and it may eventuate into some sort of an act. Um, in a very real sense, you adulterate yourself any time you engage in telling half a truth, the little white lie, you know, and we've, we've uh, sort of uh, accepted the fact in a society that there are times when it's important that you tell a little white lie. The fact is, under divine law, either you fulfill the certain requirements of the law or you do not. And almost is not enough. If I were to say, I leaned over the edge of the platform and I almost kept my balance, I fell on my face. And I fell on my face just in the same way as someone who literally threw himself headlong off the platform. Almost is not good enough if we're dealing with law, you see. And uh, now I know that we, we like to to rationalize and to explain and say, well, I really didn't mean that. I was only kidding and so forth. But under divine law, we're dealing with something that's inexorable so that the person who is really serious about trying to get to the heart and spirit of the commandments and these fundamental laws for integrated life will begin to take seriously the things he thinks and the things that he expresses uh, to exaggerate in a way that is... Uh, intended to delude someone either through your own egotistical self-appraisal or wanting greater praise and so forth is to commit adultery you're adulterating the true process of your own integrity to say something of yourself or another that is less than true in a moral sense or even and especially something that is less than the truth in a spiritual sense is committing adultery uh, if you sell yourself short out of a feeling of inferiority or with ulterior motives, you commit adultery. 
And the word ulterior is an interesting word because it's related to adultery. The altar, again, comes from the same root. If a person says one thing but intends another, we say he had an ulterior motive. And this simply means that he had an other motive than that which he was expressing or representing. And this is committing adultery, you see. He is, he is adding ultery or adding some other view or, or vicious intent to that which he represents. He commits adultery. An understatement adulterates. All of this is relative, of course, and it depends a lot on the attitude and on, on the intent. An understatement adulterates because so often it becomes a self-put-down. In other words, somebody asks you after you've... Uh, finished a game or typed a letter or finished a day's work, how did you do? And you may say, oh, all right, I guess. And in your heart, you really believe you did good. But you're caught up in that confused sense of, of, of humility so that you shouldn't really say that you did something very good, you see. You may really believe that you did something well, but false humility is adultery. Someone uh, may say to you, um, gee, that's a lovely dress you have on. And so often the reaction will be, oh, it's really an old thing. You know, it's an old rag, it's nothing. <laughs> this is a self-put-down and this is adultery because it's not honest, it's not true. We're not even true to ourselves. We don't mean that at all, you see. And that kind of even facetious misuse of the truth is an adulteration. Uh, there is a cliché, if, if you have it, flaunt it. And, of course, this, this is often terribly exaggerated, and uh, it can be expressed in ostentation and egotism and so forth. But though it is so often misused, there is a fundamental principle here that's very valid. The word flaunt actually comes from the root word, the same root word as flow. And it means that that if you have it, if you have something that's evolving in your consciousness or in your experience, it's come out of the flow of the creative process in you. And it's important to, to realize that it is a part of the flow. If we call attention to the bubbling and say, isn't that bubbling pretty? Then we're neglecting to recognize that there is something that's causing the bubbling to happen, something underneath, you see. But if we see the bubbling as a part of that inner something and in ourselves identify ourselves with it, then obviously if the bubbling is pretty, flaunt it. It's beautiful, you see. In other words, if, uh, if there's something that you do or something that you have uh, that attracts attention, this is right, it is good, as long as you keep conscious of the realization, as Jesus said, I of myself do nothing, but the Father or the creative process working through me is the cause and is the reason it comes forth. So that then, you see, you can and you should come to the consciousness or if someone says to you after a performance or after something you've written or something you've done or said, a person will say, gee, that was really fine. Rather than saying, oh, I don't really think it was, which is a self-put-down, or rather than even being embarrassed about it, if you get the sense that it is really coming out of the flow, then you can say, yes, it was good, wasn't it? Now, the interesting thing is, when one gets a, a true sense of self-worth, not egotism, but a self-worth which has come out of his own realization of oneness with the infinite process, then without any sense of ostentation, he can very easily and in a true sense, humbly, acknowledge, yes, it was really fine, wasn't it? This was a hard lesson for me, quite frankly, and uh, it took me many years to understand this. If someone after a, after a talk or after something I've done would say, gee, that was really fine, as people always like to do, whether they mean it or not, which again is another kind of adultery if they don't mean it. <laughs> but... Uh, if a person says, gee, that was a great lecture, to me there was always a kind of embarrassment and always a feeling of, you know, what will I say? And do you really think so? Or, uh, or say nothing and try to kind of blush and so forth. But I've discovered something that, that actually if I'm really being true to myself and if something that I have done has, has come out of my sincere effort to do what I feel is, 
is the best or the right thing, and if somebody appreciates it, then I should be big enough to stand aside and get myself out of the way and appraise it in the same way he is. And if he says it's good, I look at it and I say, it was good, wasn't it? Without any way feeling any tinge of egotism or overconfidence or lack of humility. And the interesting thing is if we miss this point, there is a tendency, and it's a very common tendency of all of us, to pollute the atmosphere, to adulterate our own consciousness by putting ourselves down out of a false sense of humility. And if we do it enough, obviously the power of the word being what it is, it can be very self-destructive. So it's important that we, that we develop a sense of self-worth, not an aggrandizement, not overconfidence, not egotism, but an appreciation of ourself, but that we get this sense of self-worth and self-respect and preserve it and do not allow anything to interfere or to pollute it. And there's so many simple little unconscious acts and things that we do, aside from maybe the big act of what is normally called committing adultery itself, which can destroy our self-worth and lead to self-disrespect. If you speak words of truth, for instance, in, in a prayer treatment, and, uh, and then afterwards, after you've stated some very, very positive, powerful words and you've meditated on them for a while and afterwards you say, uh, gee, I sure hope it works because I, I need that. You've polluted it right away. You've adulterated it. You've watered it down. You've destroyed it. Just in the same way as putting water in the milk or rocks in the beans. You've polluted your own spiritual treatment because you've watered it all down. Or uh, building on that, that conjectural concept of adultery referring to, uh, to the act of copulation after conception, it can also refer to the constant repetition, taking an affirmation and saying it over and over and over and over again out of a feeling of urgency. Whereas if you speak the word, then the word is implanted in, in, in mind and there is a conception. The idea is conceived in consciousness and you let it go. And if you keep saying it over and over and over again, you are committing adultery in a spiritual sense because you're breaking down this, this basic concept which you have set forth and you keep pulling it up and tearing it out and so forth by continually emphasizing this truth as if you had to say it a thousand times. Remember, Jesus talks about vain repetitions uh, in terms of criticizing the pra religious practices of people. Know the truth about a thing, speak the word of truth, and then say or feel, Amen. It's done. Period. And then let it lie. Let it alone. Let it develop. It's like planting a seed in the ground. Leave it be. Go on about your business. But to keep praying and stewing and fretting, and most of our prayer is stewing and fretting, when we keep doing it over and over, is committing adultery. Now, this is shocking, and it leaves us no room to hide, because probably if we evaluate the states of consciousness in which you and I have, have uh, spent a good bit of this day, we would have to say that this has been an adulterous day, and we're adulterous people. But we're not doing this in the sense of a self-put-down. We're doing it in the awareness that we're dealing with a spiritual principle. And certainly it, it makes obvious immediately that uh, if we have in our past spent time in wagging the finger at someone or certain people or certain segments of society who, who are sexually immoral and who, uh, who commit adultery and so forth, that we better take another look at ourselves, because just in that very kind of judgment, we are polluting the atmosphere of our own consciousness and we're committing adultery in ourselves. And two adulteries don't solve the problem, you see. And uh, this, is, this is an important thing. In other words, we want to make the commitment, I will no longer commit adultery. I will not add alter or add other, or add foreign matter, or foreign ideas, or foreign concepts to the purity of truth. I will know the truth. I will continually remind myself that I must build my life upon 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. And keep coming back to that. It's not easy. We all have a long way to go. We can see, as I pointed out, even in the life of Jesus, that he still had a way to go in certain vignettes that we see in the Gospels until he ultimately worked it all out. So we've got a long way to go, but let's don't kid ourselves. We're dealing with certain fundamental laws, and laws work, but laws are intended to be supportive. Gravity, as I keep pointing out over and over, is a supportive principle. It does not intend to throw us off the platform or throw us off curbs. It will keep us sitting in our seat. It will keep us walking stably. It will do all sorts of things for us if we don't violate certain aspects of the law. It's a supportive process. And this whole idea of thou shalt not commit adultery is dealing with the law of mind. And if we keep our minds pure, we're told, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. This is dealing with the same fundamental law. The violation of that law means that if we do not keep our mind in peace, if we see through a mirror darkly, if we go around criticizing people, condemning people, tearing ourselves down or tearing the world down, we're involved in pollution, adulteration, we're committing adultery. So we want to make that kind of commitment, and it can take us a long way. It can help us in many, many areas of our life to make the commitment. I'd like you to join with me right now in that kind of a commitment. And let's... Uh, Let's just take a moment now to, in all self-honesty, to see ourselves perhaps, if you will, as those who were gathered around that poor woman in the story in the gospel who had been taken in adultery and who were judging her, criticizing her, condemning her, and or according to their religious custom and tradition and law, they felt perfectly right and righteous in stoning her, and they were about to do so. So for just a moment, kind of identify in that situation. See yourself as one who, from time to time, has condemned or criticized society or people, perhaps has been involved in certain judgmental and uh, even retributional attitudes and thoughts and feelings. And then let's realize now that the adultery is in the thought, not in the act. It's in that which pulls down our own self-worth. And it is probably true that that poor woman taken in adultery had lost much of her own self-worth, probably hated herself a little bit, at least had some self-criticism. But what of those men? or women, or who gathered around, who are about to condemn her and a stoner. If you see yourself in that situation, can't you feel that something of the worth of your nature is lost, that you've destroyed something? And then see how so often we and society in general stands in judgment of people, and perhaps how quick we are to suggest that certain kinds of severe punishment are called for. Sometimes we say not even good enough. Thus, pulling down or adding another element into our nature, marring our self-image, our self-worth, adulterating the pure idea that we are. So then let's, under the guidance and direction of that symbolized by Jesus, saying, He that is without sin among you cast the stone. And let's admit to ourselves that we make those judgments occasionally. And we involve ourselves in an adulteration of our consciousness. But then let's accept that beautiful word that Jesus suggests to the woman. Go and sin no more. So we make that commitment now. That no matter how we have fallen down, no matter how we have polluted our consciousness and the atmosphere around us with negativity, with self-judgment and with vindictiveness, and even with such simple things as half-truths and exaggerations, 
that we commit ourselves to begin again and to work with this fundamental principle which is not coercive but supportive not intended to be retributive but tremendous to be a dynamic source of upliftment thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee and we make the commitment now to keep our mind our attitudes our feelings stayed on the one one god one mind one love And we consecrate and dedicate ourselves to living within the frame of this beautiful spiritual ideal and accepting and suggesting the willingness to pick ourselves up and to admit to our limitation any time we find ourselves engaged in mental pollution or self-adulteration rise up and begin again and keep on and keep on because that's what life is about we give thanks for this amen